Uh, so, uh, let's kick things off because we don't have a lot of time and a lot to cover. Um, so, uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we have Will from Anrock. For those who don't know, Anrock is one of the premier, relatively new, but one of the premier and fast moving companies that help um, all businesses with their essentially uh, state sales tax, which as we all know, can be a really complex and challenging um, area to, to deal with. So there are a lot of different topics we wanna to try to cover today. Um, Will, why don't we just jump into these and I will probably interrupt you at various points with questions as we go through. So NROC came to be, um, we're the sort of brainchild of Michelle Valentine, our CEO. We're about three years old. Um, and it came about from a um, implementation of a competitor of ours at another um, high growth SaaS company. Um, and after a long process, they realized that um, that competitor simply wasn't solving their needs. And the reason that those needs were met were for two um, you know, main reasons. SaaS taxability and digital goods taxability is a fundamentally um, different animal than um, you know, physical goods or e-commerce, which has been around for um, quite a while as an issue. And the second is that you know, complex subscription billing processes um, are you know fundamentally you know difficult to deal with, um, and very different from you know how you interact with say Amazon.com and you know adding eight percent to the receipt at the end of a transaction. Um, so we've been around for three years. We're growing quickly, um, and we specifically target software in the digital goods um, economy um, and handle you know sales tax compliance um, end to end. When our team or when a CEO and founder should actually be considering working with Anrock or even any of your competitors like what what is the what is the trigger point when they should say hey like i need to make sure i'm i'm handling sales tax properly we typically find that the most um you know compliance forward companies are dealing with this as soon as they cross um, a revenue threshold because it doesn't um it's easy to just start tracking your nexus and exposure um and then it becomes a set very important for you know ceos cfos um, strategic operational advisors like Levy, um, as you start to think about those big events, um, you know, for your company that could really drive impact down the road. So some of the, the reasons that we see folks, um, you know, look to, you know, deal with sales tax is around um, ongoing upcoming financings, M&A, the risk of audit, and really just flagging that, um, you know, these are things where, you know, every bit of sales tax that you're not paying today becomes a liability on your books um, down the road. And so, you know, if you're, if you have a company that is selling for, you know, 11 million EBITDA, but you have a, you know, $500,000 sales tax liability, that's going to come right out of your, you know, acquisition multiple. Um, and so it's important to deal with upfront. You're selling your, your software in, you know, X state, let's call it New York or something to make it an easy state. You're selling your software in New York. You're not collecting sales tax. You will owe that in the future, but because you've not collected it from your customers, it's going to come out of your own cash reserves, basically. If you've triggered a sales tax um, obligation because you've crossed Nexus, so in the state of New York, I believe it's you know in the, a couple hundred thousand dollars. In other states, it's a certain number of transactions. Every transaction from that point onwards, um, you will have to pay it whether you collected it from the customer or not. And that will become a liability on your books. But what are the key elements that help you figure out when you actually need to start doing those collections and how much you should be collecting, right? Like a sales tax is different in every state, every jurisdiction is different. So how much you actually charge your customers for your product is also different. But, um, you know, when should, should I, should, should you start to, so long way of saying it, should I start doing those collections immediately the moment you start selling in a state and just say, look, we're going to add 6% sales tax to every sale we make just to be safe or how should a company be thinking about once and when to start and then how to figure out when they actually really need to owe that money to a state well the good news is you don't um, necessarily have to pay for anrock to just start you know you could integrate with quickbooks and you start monitoring so um you know we offer um you know through partners like levy um, you can integrate with um, the anrock software and you can just track your exposure um, at no cost so you can just get that monitoring and see how you're you know, working towards those thresholds. So that's a big thing. Um, but yeah, in, in general, I think the 
if you want to take an even you know quicker way, you say, well, what states am I operating in? If your entire business is in California and you're selling software, then and you're selling one product, you know, I think you just watch when did we move out of state? When did we hire someone out of California? But if you're a multi-product business, um, you have a little bit of SaaS, a little bit of professional services, you know, maybe some digital goods, multiple employees in different states like Texas, New York, Washington, um, you know, then you probably a lot earlier on, you know, want to be running the integration and seeing, you know, how are we exposed? Target really quick, but like, does it make sense for a company to just say off the bat, like just to recommend, like should we be recommending to our clients who are SaaS businesses, just like, hey, no matter what, just to be safe, start collecting, just add a 5% tax line item to every one of your invoices, just to be safe and collect that money. Um, or is that still not something worth, like, let's say your bill is a thousand dollars a month for your software. Should you put 5% tax line item on that just to be extra safe? Let's say you're monitoring with Inrock, but maybe you haven't started monitoring yet. Should you just put that onto your invoice just to just to be safe? I hate to give you this answer, Adam, but it, it does, it depends. Um, and I'm not a tax lawyer, um, but I would say you probably can't apply just a unanimous rule. Like we should just start charging 5% right out of the bat. Um, Cause I do think there are some liabilities from misrepresenting tax collection as well. How do we define Nexus? How should people be thinking about that? Walk us through that, that part. So Nexus is defined in, you know, two primary ways. Um, one is economic. So that's, um, you know, how your sales have got, you know, grown over time in a certain, um, you know, jurisdiction and how across the threshold. And you might say, well, what's a jurisdiction? It's not just 50 states. It's actually every, you know, county and zip code can have different rules. So some are tracked at the state level, but some are tracked at the county level. And you need to make sure you're complying with both. Um, the second is physical nexus. So that's where an employee is. Um, but a lot of, oftentimes we get questions, well, what about an independent contractor? What about a PEO style, you know, employee? PEO employees count, absolutely. Um, independent contractors, it depends. So if I'm like an engineer or a salesperson who's really uh, very involved in the weeds of the business, um, I would say the answer is it depends, but Oftentimes that is the type of employee who even as an independent contractor could trigger Nexus. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, flip a switch, but the two things to think about is where are my employees and what are my sales in taxable states? What are the sort of triggers for Nexus? Would it be, I have two employees or contractors in that state and I've sold at least hundred thousand dollars in software this year is, and then all software sales over a hundred thousand, like the first, like over a hundred thousand is when I'm starting to collect that tax. What, what are some examples so people can kind of make this more real? California, like if we're talking a software product, you know, SaaS is a, a software as a service. There are no transaction thresholds because they don't tax SaaS. New York, they do tax SaaS. And so um, the two things you have to trigger on an economic side are, are my sales over $500,000? And am I making over a hundred transactions a year? Once you flip across those two, then you've tripped it. But there are some jurisdictions where it's just a transaction account. So you actually could have a very small like B2C seller who's just selling lots and lots of app store, um, you know, licenses. Um, and then in others where it's a hundred thousand dollars, which depending on the type of company you are, you could trip in one invoice. Got it. So, and then once, is that sort of, once you've hit that threshold, that's when you start, you need to start collecting any yes. transactions or whatever over that number is when yep. you start collecting. And in part of the challenge from what my understanding of the, the system and how it works is every state has different rules and, and therefore it's almost impossible without software like Anrock to know when you've hit Nexus and need to start collecting number one and then number two, how much to start collecting because the actual taxable amount is different um, as well in every state. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's, it's accurate. So every, so we have 50 states and then, you know, dozens and dozens or maybe even thousands of jurisdictions across the United States with their own rules and regulations. And those vary across each product code. So like software as a service, package software, infrastructure as a service, professional services, those are all different tax codes. So the number of data points that it could be 
you know, grows into like a pretty large data set to choose from extremely quickly. And so um, if you are, you know, a small team selling one product in one state once a year, yes, you could probably go online and look it up and like add it to yourself. But if you're even a small size business, um, but with multiple products in multiple states, um, it quickly can turn into hours of work. The other thing though, is if you get it wrong, you know, the risk of audit or unpaid liabilities um, and penalties can grow pretty quickly. So if I'm a, you know, million dollar business, or let's say I have a $500,000 um, sales tax liability, but I'm growing, you know, 300%, which is very common amongst high growth, um, you know, tech companies, uh, you know, the next year we could have a liability in the millions of dollars. And so, um, you know, it pays to get it right from the get go. And the reason it pays to get it right, just to, to maybe reiterate, hit the point, it's because, um, if you don't get it right and you're not collecting sales tax, it once again comes out of your actual revenue. Whereas otherwise it would just be added on to the bill, right? So anyone who's shopping, we've all done online shopping. Um, in most cases, there's a tax that's added to your, your bill before you check out. And for most of us, it's sort of just like, yep. Okay. I get it. It's a tax. I pay that as the buyer and then it's added on. I mean, then of course it gets remitted to the state. So it's not, but otherwise, if you don't collect it, but you do owe it, then you have to pay it out of your own cash reserves out of your own pocket. And then the other thing is, you know, it's sort of like um, when, you know, legal cases go awry, uh, if you are dealing with an audit or a major sales tax obligation, um, there's a lot of legal processes. One, um, you know, if it's a small number, you can just, you know, file historically. If it's a big number, you have to go through agreements and processes with the state where you need to get accountants and lawyers involved and the professional service like cleanup fees will go into the tens of thousands of dollars from even a relatively small liability. We talked about SaaS. Are there services side things they should be considering? Um, I know Anrock doesn't really focus on um, direct to consumer type work, but like, how do, are there things that, that just from a general perspective that um, our clients should be thinking about since Levy works with folks across the board? Yeah, exactly. I, I did want to cover um, sort of the SaaS, digital goods, e-com services, because I know that with you guys, all of it is relevant. And so, um, I think the first thing to think about is, you know, what is like physical goods, e-commerce. So um, physical goods is just anything tangible. Can I hold it in my hand? And so if I'm a D2C website and I'm selling pillowcases, that's absolutely physical goods. Now I could be e-commerce and be digital goods if I'm selling audiobooks, podcasts, uh, digital photography, NFTs even count. Um, and those would be digital goods. And those are considered separate from SaaS, which is like software as a service, downloadable software, on-premise software. Um, and then you brought up a good point around professional services. So uh, professional services are almost always not taxable, although they are sold alongside these products. And so um, they would not be taxable, but you still need to sort of process them. And then um, some companies that are purely professional services um, typically don't need to worry about this because uh, they just can say that they're not taxable at all and and not be too worried about getting audited. It's still worthwhile for them to sign up for for Anrock sort of free like service to just track this just to make sure because once again every state's a little bit different things like that is that a useful one is it a useful thing for every company out there to who, who might have liability, which once again, if you're actually having some revenue and selling stuff, you might have liability to sign up for what for Anrock's product to just monitor. Is that a useful thing or not necessarily? SaaS digital goods side? Absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of just what we cover today for an e-commerce company in the physical goods space, that's not our bread and butter. And then if you're a pure play professional services firm, um, and I don't want to speak to exactly what Levy is because you know it better than I do, but you guys probably do not need to worry about sales tax yourself as a, you know, consultancy. It sounds like though, there's still be, because of what you guys are offering an opportunity that this is just a good recommendation for every startup. If you're, once again, as long as you're a SaaS, a SaaS company, um, to sign up for Anrock, because why not? Like, this is just good to monitor and make sure you're not missing stuff and the cost is your time. Or, or in this case, Levy would help you do it anyways. It'd be Levy. Yeah, if you're a Levy customer and you know you're on QuickBooks, Zero, um, you know you're already on that tech stack. To you know to just start tracking your sales tax exposure through Anrock, 
you know, is an extra 25 minutes of your time and probably 15 because, uh, you know, Levy's there to, to show you the way. Uh, um, just in relation to professional services, so NROC will track, say my client has professional offers a professional service and NROC will track in what state that professional or jurisdiction or county that that a professional service is taxed. So for example, if their service is something like um, like therapy, like do, do does my client need to know if that's taxed first before using NROC or will NROC help with figuring out if that needs to be taxed or not? Does that make sense? Will NROC help with the taxability assignment of whether their therapy is um, a service or, or not? Yes. Yes. Um, so we have guidelines um, and we can sort of point you in the, the right direction. Ultimately, it is up to the client to make like a final determination to their own taxability. Um, with that said, uh, the rules around professional services are pretty clear. Um, and, you know, I would say like a therapy business is not the first to ask this question. Um, and so it, it's um, like fairly cut and dry. But yes, ultimately the client makes that assignment. The way this works, from what I understand, is it depends on how your accountant and bookkeeper are ta is tagging your revenue. So if your revenue is defined as professional services within your balance sheet in PL, um, that is what then NROC would pull in as the, the legal determination by your bookkeeper of how you're categorizing your revenue. Um, and then that is what you'll then decide. Do you have Nexus? Does the state tax that professional service or that that other product you're selling um, as well? So I'll give you an example for one of my clients. Um, they have uh, an e-commerce product and they have a more digital product as well. And so that is those are defined differently on there um, by their bookkeeper. And so there are different tax liabilities related, I believe, related to each one. But then they need a good service, um, like Anrock or any other companies that are out there, to help them decide, hey, how much is really owed in these states? And, and then how do I even remit? So that's actually another part I'd love to talk about as well as help companies. So, okay, you, you decide, hey, look, you owe $10,000 to the state of New York for taxes due to the products you sold. Um, do you then help this, the companies remit that money to the state? Or is that done separately, you're just saying, hey, you're flagging, we believe you owe this. Yeah, um, great question. So NROC is full stack, it's uh, end to end. And so it starts with the monitoring and then we will flag where your exposure is. And so, um, Leon, just in your example, like we would separate the two. So there would be the, like, for instance, Washington State, professional services is not taxable, SAS is. And so we would take, say, the $100 of SAS count that towards the sales tax obligation, and we would ignore the professional services while still tracking it, but but ignoring it from a tax perspective. Once they'd crossed a threshold, then ANROC would make it easy, like in a few clicks, you could say like register, make that determination. And then um, we would handle the registration process with the state. And then um, at that point, once you're registered, that's when, um, you would now start adding it to the invoice, uh, you know, at the time of billing the, the customer. And so, you know, that platform or the client of yours would then start adding the, you know, 6%, 8%, it, you know, depends on the area. And then um, we absolutely handle all of the, you know, monthly or quarterly returns and filing and, you know, ultimately taking it from your customer's bank account and filing it to like the state tax bureau. So just to make sure, I, I'll restate that for you. So basically, you would you would monitor and say, okay, look, you've hit Nexus now. Um, you owe 8%. You, you need to start collecting 8%. Then the customer manually adds that 8% tax line item to their invoices, however, whatever via whatever tool they're using. Um, they start collecting that money. That money goes into their company bank account. You then automatically pull that money from the bank account on a monthly basis or whatever the, the correct timing is. And then you help remit that, make sure that gets remitted to the state itself. Is that generally the flow? Yeah. One big correction though, is there's no manual adding the 8%. So, you know, ANROC would integrate with QuickBooks in this case, or, or Stripe or Chargebee or something. And, and we are um, automatically, when you create an invoice, we will automatically now add the, the tax rate. Got it. So you add the tax rate. That's great. But then it's still collected by the company. And then you pull that money from the company's bank account to make the payment to the states. Yes, but that's all, uh, it's like relatively automated. Technically unregister, 
but it's a very laborious process and you know states like frankly to have the the, the line of sight into what your business is doing so um, they, they create lots of like caveats to the deed registration process and that like you have to have no business activity for like a certain threshold of time and things so um, it can be done but like they there's a high qualification bar to deregister and hence remove nexus but you could file a zero dollar return and so one of the nice things about anrock is that we don't charge per return and so you know if you need to file zero dollar returns it's not you know adding to your cost Thank you.